1916, there was panic on the streets of wartime St. Petersburg, Russia. The bare necessities of life, food and fuel to stave off the winter chill, were in short supply. And in far off Germany, a generation of Russian men was being decimated by the World War. For all this heaped up misery, many Russians blamed Rasputin, and many simply wanted him dead. A group of assassins plotted to kill the monk. They were led by 29-year-old Prince Felix Yusupov, who was reputed to be a drug addict and bisexual. On the night of December 30th, 1916, they descended to the basement of Prince Felix's palace. They'd invited Rasputin to a party, enticing him with the promise of meeting the prince's beautiful wife, Irina. They cranked up the gramophone with their one record, Yankee Doodle Dandy, and awaited their guest of honor. It's hard to say what Rasputin was expecting to find at that palace the night uh, that he was killed, whether it was Irina Yusupov and sex with her, or Felix Yusupov and sex with him, or a whole group of gypsies and sex with them, or just lots of uh, drugs and, uh, you know, alcohol. Their planned means of assassination, poison. The peasant monk had a famous sweet tooth, so they piled the table high with pastries and Madeira wine. All of it spiked with deadly cyanide. Rasputin arrived. While he waited for the prince's wife, he reportedly ate the poison pastries, drank the cyanide-laced wine. And nothing happened. Two hours passed, and Felix panicked. And he says, the poison's not happening. What am I going to do? Shoot him, they say. So he gets his gun comes downstairs again and finds Rasputin admiring rather an elegant crucifix. And Yusufa says, I should have a really good look at that if I were you. You may, I think you're going to need it. Allegedly, in the hope that the crucifix is going to help him have his bullet not be deflected by his magic powers. He keels over and Yusufa goes skipping upstairs again, saying, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it and they all start celebrating. After a few celebratory rounds, the prince went back downstairs to look at the corpse and encountered the unbelievable. Though poisoned and shot, Rasputin was still alive. His eyes were bugging out of his head and, and he ran screaming through the palace, he's still alive, he's still alive. Uh, promptly ran into his mother's bathroom where he started to vomit all over the place, then passed out. According to his own life story, Prince Felix recovered in time to catch Rasputin, trying to make his escape through the courtyard. Another assassin then pumped two more bullets into the holy man. The conspirators beat and kicked the apparently lifeless body, bound the hands with rope, and tossed it into the Neva River. Yet Rasputin still seemed to have had one more surprise in store. With Rasputin in the grim waters of the Neva River, the assassins thought he was quite dead, finally. But was he? When his body was found two days later, uh, they'd actually found that he had still been alive when he had gone into the water because he had managed to work free one of his hands and, and tried to raise uh, his right arm in sign of making the cross. Uh, so he actually ended up drowning after being shot and poisoned and stabbed and bludgeoned. But historical suspicion hovers over Prince Yusupov's account of the killing. Perhaps to glorify his own determined role, in his memoirs, he painted Rasputin as a superhuman devil who would not die. But testimony gathered by the Russian secret police told a different story. When you begin to compare these memoirs, this testimony of different eyewitnesses, you understood that this night was a little bit different. For one thing, the poison pastry story may have been a fabrication. By the time of his death, Rasputin had reportedly sworn off sweets. It's impossible to eat cakes. He had diet, special diet of healer. 
Doubt has also centered on the supposed final cause of death. Death by drowning may have just been a convenient story for his enemies because it was such an inglorious end for, to some, a holy man. A lot of people were terrified that Alexandra would want to make Rasputin Saint Rasputin. If he dies by drowning, he cannot be a saint. And so I am convinced that there are enough people interested in rigging the cause of death. Even in death, Rasputin's reputed gift for mystical prophecy seemed to prevail. A few days before his assassination, Rasputin had composed one last prediction in the form of an ominous telegram dispatched to the Tsar at his headquarters near the war's front line. Tsar, if you hear the sound of the bells, it signals I'm dead. If I'm killed by my brothers, the Russian peasants, you have nothing to fear. If it is your relations, who have brought about my death, then none of your family will remain alive more than two years. They will all be killed by the Russian people. After Rasputin's death, brought about indeed by royal family relatives, events moved rapidly. The Tsar headed hurriedly back home on news of bread riots in the streets. He was forced to abdicate, and soon the Bolsheviks seized power. The Tsar's entire family was taken to Yekaterinburg, a city in the mountains where they were held captive. July 1918, 18 months after Rasputin's final prophecy, its prediction came true. Nicholas, Alexandra, and their five children were lined up in a dingy basement and shot. The executioners rifled through the clothing of the former imperial family. Alexandra and her young daughters were found to be hiding precious jewels sewn into their dresses. And around their throats were religious medallions containing prayers and portraits of Rasputin, the all-too-accurate prophet. <laughs>